Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I forgot that you were here. Uh, yeah, I'm just doing a little reading, you know. Ali, one of the goats. Uh, anyway, anyway. Yeah, no, yeah. I was just reading up on some boxing because you know I'm about to I'm about to talk a lot about boxing. So I'm not gonna talk about the history of boxing per se because we would be here for a while. But no, I'm gonna talk about how the evolving technology, the changing technology throughout for the communication apparatus of society allowed for boxing to be more and more marketable as the years went on because as the technology changed the markability of the sport changed which grew it in what it is today. The first recorded fight was in the UK in 1861 and that since has brought more people together and you know that was also recorded on the newspaper they were very localized like if the newspaper in New York said this you're not gonna get a you're not going to get something in Chicago. It's going to be mostly what have, their New York papers are going to be like the epicenter because that's where all the action is. While they're going to like papers around the surrounding areas are going to copy it. So like Chicago papers are going to have Chicago papers, Chicago news stories about New York news stories. Yeah. But anyway, let's get that's I could go on and on about newspapers. First big fight that involved radio, which is that's important to remember, was between Jack Dempsey and Georges Carpentier, a Frenchman, on July 2nd, 1921 at Boyle's 30 Acres Stadium in New Jersey. This was the first big radio broadcast because it was broadcast on radio. It was heard over 125,000 square miles. So that meant basically you could hear it from Maine all the way to Maryland and far as Western Ohio. They set up this fight for Jack Dempsey and Carpentier to fight and then because they figured out oh, only the local people are going to see it. No, this radio fight allowed fans across the country to hear that fight. This fight went viral in the 1920s. This is an edition of 1920s virality. So I feel like that's one pod, that's one of the first big moments that boxing was marketable and the communication made it more marketable to, to the great society. So you know, yeah. But also, it's important to note that boxing not only was available, was not just marketable and like mon monetary wise, it was also marketable for societal and propaganda wise. I say this because in 1936 there's a fight between Joe Lewis and Max Schlemming which was the one of they titled it the fight of the century which they have a lot of those names where that you just gotta cut that aside I mean that's promotional but that's one of the plays in the market marketability of the sport but that, well, that's the best that's beside the word. So but back to Joe Lewis and Mark, Max Schlemming this was in 1936 on June 6th, 1936, at Yankee Stadium, the old Yankee Stadium. Mind you, this was in World War II. It was, this fight was the USA versus Nazi Germany. They didn't want to, there wasn't like any explicit, but it was very implicitly applied that the winner of this fight is going to reign superiority over the rest of the world. That's what sports, that's what this fight does. That's what boxing was able to do. It was marketed to do that. But you know, and then radio allowed it, that kind of boosted up the image of the fight. And then news and journalism, news, the newspapers and newspaper editors, they like symbolize this fight, which therefore, again, it marketed the fight in boxing to what, to make it bigger than it really was. So, but, and then, yeah, and then, but basically the set, the moral of the story is that Lewis lost the fight in, in a round 12 because of a knockout. Can't win them all, and that. But that led to a rematch in 1938, which Joe Lewis won. It's important to note that 70 million people listened to that rematch. That's a lot of people in the 19 late 30s, because we were just coming out of the depression. So that's important to remember. 70 million people. That's a lot of people. That's still a lot of people today, but that's a lot of people in 1938. So and then that just shows you radio is really going. And the upward trend. So now this leads us to the 40s, the golden age of radio. This is because FDR gave a great, used the radio as a great advantage because it allowed him to connect with his constituents, the people to provide them a sense of calming. And he did this after Pearl Harbor because he wanted to show that Americans that everything was going fine, this is what happens. It allowed them to know what was going on. So it, this allowed radio to really expand. Times are changing. That was true in the 50s with the technology because TV was becoming more popular. In 1946, there were 6,000 TV sets. That raised from 
and that was raised up to 12 million in 1951. So that just shows a lot of things. And also, this also meant boxing could be more accessible because there's only three main channels at the time whenever TV was made. ABC, NBC, and CBS. So, boxing was theoretically only on, one, on a third of those channels all the time, on, mostly on Friday nights. So, I mean, you could put two together, boxing became more marketable because it was on more often. So, therefore, it was able to grow in popularity. And also, a big date and technology date, which kind of transcended, that would help boxing transcend what it would be later on in the 90s. 1953, the first color TV. Also, you know, 1954, 55, Vegas became a hot spot. It made boxing more marketable because more interest, because why wouldn't you want to go to Vegas to see a fight? It's the bright lights. You can gamble. There's an interesting guy, Cassius Clay. He fought Sonny Liston in, on February 25th, 1964 in Miami Beach, Florida. He just won the World Heavyweight Championship. But that's interesting. That's kind of cool because, you know, the marketability was, oh, look, there's a new... Um, the new heavyweight champion of the world. However, that's only part of it. Two days later, I'll say this again, two days later, Cassius Clay announces to the media that he's changing his name to Muhammad Ali because he joined the Nation of Islam. Before I go too much into the, the 70s and Ali, I could, do it, I could explain it, but I wouldn't do it justice. I'm going to let you listen to the man, the myth, the legend, Jonathan Eag, right now. So... It's almost impossible to, uh, to exaggerate how important he was to boxing. Um, when he came along in the 60s, boxing was really in the doldrums. It hadn't had a popular champion in a long time. Popularity was fading. Um, and, uh, and he really revitalized the sport on the sheer power of his personality as much as his boxing skills. Um, so even before um, he became the champ, just his his whole persona really um, electrified fans and and made boxing um, you know a big spectacle again. And then when he became the heavyweight champion, um, and then when he became this hugely controversial figure, and everybody had an opinion on him, and he became more than just an athlete, he became an important social and political figure. Uh, all of that just made boxing more and more important. Then you get into the, his comeback and you get the 70s where he has these great rivalries and these are the biggest sporting events um, in the world. More people watching him fight Frazier and Foreman um, than have ever seen a, a, you know, a live sports event. So I think you know, Ali, is um, he really is boxing um, in the second half of the 20th century. Ali was made for TV and, and TV loved Ali. So I think that they, they it's, it's hard to imagine one without the other. And I don't think boxing would have enjoyed the resurgence in popularity if not for TV and if Ali, if not for Ali being so wonderful on TV, you know, he just, um, he lit up the screen and in a way that, you know, um, Sonny Liston never could have, um, Joe Frazier never could have. Ali was just, you know, became this, this, you know, magnetic personality. And, you know, even if he had never boxed again after, um, you know, the Liston fight, he would have been a huge celebrity just on, on the sheer force of his personality. The 70s ended. TV was, color TV has become the norm. Um, ESPN played a big role in the marketability of boxing and the communica communication aspect of boxing because ESPN was created in 1979. Showtime HBO Boxing allowed the marketability of the sport to grow because they have their own channel, exclusively their own channels to grow the sport. You know, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So that allowed the communicational aspect, the, the t growing technology to have their own channel to grow the sport of marketing. So, I mean, that's a pretty good marketing move. You know, and also, for note, in the sport boxing, Mike Tyson became the youngest heavyweight champion of the world on November 22nd. This re-energized the sport because, again, just like Ali, we had the youngest heavyweight champion. We had a young heavyweight champion, so you, boxing could market themselves off of that. 1987, Mike Tyson bit Evander Holyfield ear. They showed you, they showed you that Mike Tyson actually bit Holyfield ear, which is kind of weird. The 90s was a very chaotic decade because the marketability of the sport kind of was peaking because pay-per-view was slowly becoming a thing and communicationally because more and more people could see it. In 2000s, this is when it gets very interesting because eyes are moving away from boxing. You can only market it so much, you know, because, I mean, it's two guys beating the crap out of each other. 
And that, while that's interesting, it's just two guys standing up boxing, you know. But WWE, UFC is become more popular, so that's taken away the eyes, and they they, they can market it differently because UFC is jujitsu, it's karate, it's all kinds of stuff. Wrestling, it's the spectacle, it's tables, eyes, and chairs. Oh my, you know, stuff like that. Well, it's hard to keep up with that. And also, boxing becomes more exclusive, which, again, it kind of the marketability of that is that it. It's more exclusive, but that's the downside. It's more exclusive. It doesn't mean it's very selective who's interested in it. So, you know, and also pay-per-views, like I said, in the 90s, pay-per-views are becoming the norm. The 90s, now it's becoming the norm in the 2000s. Whenever you see bo thing of boxing, you think of, oh, the pay-per-view event between two heavyweights. That's whenever it gets exclusive, and therefore the big person of that that grew the sport of boxing in the 2000s was Floyd Money Mayweather. Mayweather was able to market himself and the sport on pay-per-views because one he's just a really good fighter people love to hate him and he just was great at marketing the sport of boxing because it allowed him to grow the sport and also grow his bank account because he got paid a lot of money because people wanted to see him lose a big example of this would be Mayweather versus Manny Pacquiao and Floyd Mayweather versus Conor McGregor each of those fights were upwards of about four million pay-per-views good way to realize that the explosion of the radio that it was the 20s and such that was able to radio but it wasn't that it was successful but not that successful but the radio really exploded in the 40s which became the popular sport of the decade for a good solid 20 25 years because it was just that's what it was it was boxing became all on the radio and then tv became popular and then color tv really took off as just as muhammad ali became popular which therefore showcased his talent but he was a polarizing figure so that made it very interesting to watch which was very fun to watch pay-per-views and then now to streaming services so what does the future hold for boxing i don't know i can tell you one thing do not count boxing out because you can get knocked down in it but give it at least a 10 count because they're going to rise right back up that's it